<laughs> now, um, I've known Romy for a really, really, really long time. Romy and I um, even played netball together. So, <laughs> um, but as it, as I haven't really spent much time with Rom for years because, as, as she, she's told you, she lived, she's lived divorced all that time. Now, um, Romy's a writing therapist and she's a counsellor and she's an author and she lives in Thailand now and lived for years in Cambodia. And after four years in Cambodia, um, where there she managed a hip hop centre for street kids from the slums in Phnom Penh, she transitions to dance therapy to, and then into writing therapy in Thailand. Um, she, there in, um, in Thailand, she introduced a workshop called Writing from the Source and Writing Therapy. So a profound and wonderful way to reconnect to yourself and the expression of words. So Romy's going to impart some of that knowledge that she has and wisdom that she has with us and then maybe um, allow some practical space for you to be able to get some of your own wisdom and own, own skills up. So thanks, Rom.
you know, community pressures, depending on what kind of, you know, world you live in. And I think, you know, I grew up in the Jewish community in Melbourne. It wasn't somewhere I ever actually fit into, and I found all of those pressures of what I should and shouldn't do just never suited me. And sometimes I rebelled, but there was always severe consequences. And then sometimes I conformed, but I felt really unhappy. So fresh out of school, I went to university because that's what a good Jewish girl does. You know, you go to university and you get married and have children, and that's that. There is no, there is no other option. That's what you're meant to do, and it's not a choice. That never suited me. I'm 41, and I'm still living overseas and doing what I want, and I'm childless, and I'm happy. So it just didn't suit me, but I did go into it because I was meant to. I hated it. I failed most subjects, and I snuck out and went overseas in the middle. It just didn't feel right for me. Uh, years later, after I did finish the degree, terribly, but I finished it, um, it was a social science degree and I majored in law. At the end of it, the only thing that I loved was the, the legal stuff. I really enjoyed that. So at the end, I thought, oh, maybe I'll stick with the legal stuff and I'll become a lawyer, because you know, it's felt like the right thing to do at 22 or something. And my parents got wind of that, and I could hear them on the phone. Our daughter's going to be a lawyer. Our daughter's going to be a lawyer. Oh, you Jewish girl's going to be a lawyer. Of course she is. And then I realised, I'm like, oh my God, it's not what I want. It's really not what I want. And the more I heard them say it, the more angry I got. And I'm like, now what do I do? Now I'm going to have to tell them that that's not what I want. I went and became a sports teacher. Um, I was just always an athlete in my sports, so I just went to schools and said... I'm here. I'm an athlete and I'm also when you should hire me, and they did. This is back in the day when, you know, you could do that kind of thing. And, um, and then I decided to study photography. So I was working, you know, four days a week as a sports teacher, one day a week as a photographer. I was studying. And I loved it. Wow, I had never loved something so much in my life. And at the end of that one year of doing one day a week, I decided I wanted to be a photographer. So um, I went into the university that I was studying and basically said, I want to be a photographer. And they told me, they said, there's no way. As in, you don't have a portfolio. Doing half a day, one day a week for one year is not a good enough hole for you to actually go and get into an arts course where you need the whole portfolio and you need all of this kind of stuff. And I sat there and I remember to this day, I just looked at them and I was like, no, you don't understand. I have to do this. And I was leading them with tears in my eyes. I'm like, this is the first time in my life where I know that I'm meant to be sitting right here. This is what I need to be doing. I have to do this. And I promise you, you won't regret it. I will be the best student you've ever had and the best photographer ever been. And I got in. They just sort of looked at me and they're like, no one's ever done that to us. <laughs> so, okay. So I got in. And then step two, tell the family. And I had the exact same reaction. What kind of Jewish girl goes and becomes a photographer? <laughs> and even then I was like, what's Jewish got to do with anything? Who cares? But Jewish female photographer was just not going to happen. So I moved out. So I started, you know, I'd done the social science degree. I wasn't happy. I looked at the, the role of uh, going down the law. It didn't make me feel good. Photography was, I had to listen to my heart. I had to listen to my gut. I, my whole body smiled so much when I thought of doing photography that I had to do it. So I did and I went on and I actually worked as a photographer in Australia and around half the world for eight years. I was a photography lecturer. I absolutely loved it. It was the best thing I ever did. Before I got into my more current world, of, I went back and studied social work and did masters in international public health. and. Um, always really felt that there was more to give, always wanted to do counseling, wanted to work with people, and I've worked in mental health and drug and alcohol and homelessness. And, um, and I've always, in hindsight, I've probably always done different forms of creative arts therapy without realizing. Um, I loved volunteer work. I, there was always more to do, always more to give. So I was in Vietnam doing art therapy with deaf students. I was in Cambodia, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I've, now I'm doing writing therapy. I was always doing different types of therapy, different types of group work, and always because it felt right. So since, you know, the whole social work and that whole, uh, before, I'm um, sorry, social science debacle at the university, I've never done something 
that didn't come from my body and make me smile. So it was always asking my body how it feels. So you can ask, you know, people talk about, you know, the head and the heart, people talk about the right and the left brain, there's all these different theories about all different things. Uh, there's a lot of research now, there's psychologists and science and psych psychiatrists around the stomach being the second brain. So, and some people are talking about the stomach being close to the first brain, and it's all about the stomach. I call it the gut because the stomach more sounds like the digestive system. But um, it's the decision making space, the center of your emotions. You know, you've all, you've all would have experienced at some point gut feeling. You just had a gut feeling, uh, butterflies in your stomach. So it's like the intuition, it's the space that knows often before you do. I remember driving years and years ago, and I was about to cross Dandenong Road, and it was late at night, there was no traffic, it was two in the morning, and I'm about to cross Dandenong Road, and it's a green light, and my gut just went, Ugh, and I just stopped, stopped driving in the middle of the road. And I sort of thought, what am I doing? Why did I stop? It's a green light. And then this car flew across. And I was just like, oh my God. So I feel my intuition really guides me, because it seems to know things that I don't know. So there are ways that you can learn to listen to that space. So working as a writing therapist now, I combine writing with breath work with listening to your body. And that's the stuff that I teach, it's the stuff that I do, it's the stuff that I do in workshops. And it's all, you know, someone asked me at a presentation I did the other day um, about writer's block. And for me, writer's block is an argument between your head your heart and your gut. And they're three different spaces. So mostly we start with our head, you know. Our head will write the list. And lists are very important. I'm a huge fan of pros and cons lists. I write a list about everything. So you write your list. Why should I do this? Why shouldn't I do this? What's the good, the bad, the pros, the cons? You'll have a heart reaction about how you feel about it. You know, you do it from a place of warmth or, you know, what are you, do, what are you feeling about it? And the gut, for me, is almost the mediator. When you're arguing between your head and your heart, you know, your heart's saying, you know, follow this man to, you know, wherever, the other side of the world. And your head's saying, you can't do that, that's ridiculous. <laughs> your gut will be the one that gives you the answer. The gut, for me, is the mediator. So you've got your head and your heart, and then your gut. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, does someone want to volunteer to see how that works. Is there anyone here that currently has a decision they need to make between two different things? Um, I've got a decision next year around counselling training by uni or with yoga training. Okay. Hmm. All right. So are you happy for to be used as the guinea pig? So next year you can either do counselling training or do yoga training. Okay, what I'm going to ask you, do you have a pen on you? Yeah. yeah. If you can write down those two statements, next year I'm going to do counseling training, next year I'm going to do yoga training. So step one is firstly identifying what are the options that I'm trying to choose between. Step two is actually writing them down as if they are a positive statement. I am going to. So the statement needs to be the truth. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So the statements can't be wishy-washy. So I'm going to, next year, I'm going to do yoga training. Next year, I'm going to do counseling training. Always in your own words. Finish. Finish. Yeah. Okay. Complete. Yeah. And have you written them into positive statements? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to come and join me here? Well, what if your decision is to do something or not do it? Yeah. So you can just say, oh, I'm not going to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Asia next year. I'm not going to go to Asia. Yeah, so I'm going to stay in Melbourne. Sit down. Mm. Yeah, see, it's a hard to isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so you've got the two there? Yeah. Okay. So, yep. okay. so just totally ignore everybody. Yeah. I'm going to you close your eyes. I'm going to take three really big deep breaths all the way down to your belly.
say it louder like we really mean it. Next year, <laughs> I'm going to complete my counselling training. Okay, close your eyes. Just take a breath. Keep repeating that back to yourself inside. Next year, I'm going to complete my counselling training. Seeing how that feels in your body. Next year I'm going to complete my yoga training. Next year I'm going to complete my yoga training. Next year I'm going to complete my yoga training. observation that when she was saying the yoga the head was going like like it was quite phenomenal yeah the first time she was saying I'm going to do counseling and the second time was like 
I'm going to do yoga training. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost worth videoing yourself yeah. if it's you're video. doing it. Yeah. yeah, no, but if you're at home yeah. doing it to yourself or to a mirror with your eyes closed so that you're not sort of being self-conscious, if you just sort of selfie video yourself to notice the smile, the nod. Yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. Yeah. Also, it was also a ton of her voice. Yeah. She went up, but it was more, um, but not up until a throat throat day. Yeah. Like, and then I think that we all do it every time we say anything. Um, mm. As a society, we're socially ingrained to not notice that in others or ourselves, so if you ignore it, it's really just about unlearning that, yeah. unlearning that ingraining. Yeah. And I'll continue it for a second on along the lines of what Felicia is saying is I do a lot of work with people, and I'll talk about going into all of it now because a whole huge topic about negative thought patterns and tone of voice is huge in negative thought patterns um, if you're ever telling yourself something fairly negative and you know we all do it different times it's always got a harsh stern kind of deeper tone of voice it's like you're not good enough you know, it's got that kind of feeling around it and if you work with negative cycles and you try and rephrase that into a positive and switch it out if you're not good enough to you can do anything. You would never say, you can do anything. <laughs> so you'd be like, you're not good enough. And then once you learn how to switch it up, you'd be like, you can do anything. So you automatically feel kind of light and fluffy and want to hug yourself. The tone of voice is really, really important. So notice it in yourself. I mean, if you have children, please notice how you talk to children. <laughs> notice the tone of your voice mm-hmm. and what it Huge, huge, huge impact. I've been going to a lot of netball in the last few weeks because I still do love netball and my little nieces and nephews are playing. And the tone of voice from the mothers on the side of the court. Oh, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> Hurry up, run back. And you know, well done. I'm like, that's not well done. That's <laughs> like I'm in trouble and terrified. <laughs> so, tone of voice is really, really important. Okay, then if we can move on, how am I doing for time? I have no concept of time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe another 10. Okay, well, <laughs> give it just a few mm-hmm. options for questions. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to quickly get into, this is how I make notes, <laughs> um, is journaling. Does anyone here journal? Yeah? Oh, cool. Quite a few people do. Journaling is really, really important. Dealing with your own shit. I actually want to change my counseling sessions to be called Deal with Your Shit. <laughs> Deal with Your Shit. I, mean, um, I use writing therapy in my counseling sessions, but journaling is really, really important. If you're not already journaling. Some people say that I don't know what to say. If I'm journaling, what do I write about? So, very quick tip on if you don't know what to write about for those that aren't yet journaling, you can answer four really simple questions every day. Um, then you can start with what was the highlight of my day? What was the low light of my day? What did I learn today? And what am I going to do about it? We forget to do. We learn every day something, and then we go, oh yeah, that's right, I was going to do something about it, and we forget. So very important to implement what you're learning. Um, in journaling also, what I really want to teach people is to be really mindful and thoughtful with your choice of words. We get really lazy with our words, um, particularly with computers. Don't journal online, by the way. Like journal, write, pen, paper. Um, and by, by being mindful with your choice of words, I mean often people say, oh, I had a shit day, or I'm a bit sad, or I'm annoyed. What does that mean? I'm sad. Okay, well, what's sad? Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Are you annoyed? Are you frustrated? Are you lonely? What is it? You can't just say I'm sad, I'm happy, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm cool, I'm not. And you'll find when you write that down, you will start getting really picky about the words. Uh, the great thing with writing also is you can't write nothing. You know when you talk to someone, how are you? Oh, yeah, no, cool, well, you know, a bit stressed, but, um, you know. It's not even a sentence. (laughs) So, if you wrote that down, if I said, how are you? Actually, you know what? Don't tell me I want you to write it down. You would actually have to choose your words. 
and become really mindful of your choice of word. And you would never write, I'm cool. I'm cool. I would say that all the time. My family still tease me. Oh, are you cool today, Ronnie? But I would have to find actual words. And then if you're not good at finding your words, if you're not good at identifying emotions, a really good trick is to close your eyes and imagine what that word would be in a movie. So picture that you have to describe it to someone that's never experienced it. So, you know, if you're choosing lonely or anxious or happy, you know, what does happy look like? What does happy look like to someone that hasn't experienced it? What's my version of happy versus your version of happy versus your version of happy? What does it look like in a movie? And then write the description of the movie. You know, instantly when I said the word happy, I saw a cartoon-like character being led by helium balloons that were red in the blue sky and they were going up. Like, you know, you, you automatically have some kind of visual. You know, you might be red balloons. Like red balloons is angry. Red is angry. So everyone has a different interpretation of what words mean. So it's worth journaling through what it is that, um, you know, that you're trying to find. What are the words that you're looking for? Okay. All right. So I'm going to move to the end bit. Yeah. Got time for it? Um, letter writing. Okay. Letter writing is really, really an amazing thing. You can write a letter to absolutely anyone, anything, anytime. And it's always profound and powerful and brilliant. You can write letters to parts of yourself. Whether you are accepting that part of yourself, rejecting that part of yourself, letting go of that part of yourself. So you can write a letter to your ego. You can write a letter to your heart if you feel that you're not listening enough. You can write a letter to any part of you. You can write a letter to your weight. If you're having an issue with weight, if you've lost a lot of weight, if you've on a lot of weight, and tell them how you feel. Make them your friend. You can write a letter to your anger. Say, listen, you're no longer serving me anymore. I get why you're there. I get how you helped me through teenagehood. I'm not a teenager anymore. I need to let you go. Thank you for your help. I no longer need you. So you write a letter and you tell them how you feel. What they have done for you, what have they have done against you why it does or doesn't work, and how you choose to let it go. You always have to make the actual choice. I choose to let you go now. You can do it to ex-husbands and wives. You can do it to people that have passed on and that you never had the opportunity to say something to. So you can do it for absolutely any purpose. The reason is never to give the letter. The reason is for you to let go. So often, so ex-husbands is a big one that I tend to work with people with, but it's choosing to let go. It's like whether you're saying I love you, I hate you, or whatever, I now choose to let go. I choose to move on. I choose to live life. Yeah. So if you're doing that letter and you feel that you're not ready to choose to let go, yeah. how would you work through that and approach that situation? Um, with real honesty, so you would write where you're up to and then say, you know, I would like to get to the point of letting go. I'm not quite there yet, but this is where I'm up to and, you know, to be continued kind of thing. But it's a matter of really, really being honest with yourself. And it's really profound, particularly with things like ex-husbands or people that have passed on, um, whether it's parents or whether you had a good relationship or a bad relationship. It's really powerful, but only if you're honest and really, really honest. And often when I'm sitting with people, they're like, oh, I don't know what to write. And then I'll bump into them days later and they've written like 12, 12 pages, you know. You just can't stop. Um, so it's really powerful. For me, what I recommend is once you finish the letter, so you write everything, and I mean everything. You can say, I hate you for this, I love you for that, you hurt me doing this, whatever it is. I mean, really let it all out, beginning to end and everything else in between. At the end, though, you must conclude it. Even if your conclusion is, I'm not ready to let you go now. But you have to tell them what you're doing now. I'm choosing to let you go. I'm choosing to continue on my journey of trying to let you go, whatever it is. And then what you do with it is you make a ceremony. And that's totally up to you, whatever is your personality. 
So often, you know, you can see it with crystals, incense, whatever it is, but you will burn the letter with intention. And with your own ceremony, with your own prayer of, I am choosing to move on. I'm choosing to let you go. I'm choosing to, to live my life, and you let it go. And you will find that you will really feel that difference. I actually did a ceremony with one of my closest friends recently over her ex-husband. She'd written a letter a few weeks earlier. She didn't think that she could. She wrote about eight pages, and then her and I did a ceremony together with the fire, and she read it to herself. She put it in the fire. She cried. We hugged, and then she just looked at me, and she was like, I've been fucking amazing. And, and that, for her, it was done. You know, she was a few years divorced already, but she never actually let go. So even if you've been divorced 10 years, if you've never done some kind of ceremony or process, it's still worth doing. Even things that you think you've dealt with, it's still worth doing. So um, the last thing I'm going to give you, but it's homework, so it's all right. I love giving homework. So I give homework, I can't You were a teacher it. once. I know. <laughs> um, and it is a bit of a sneak peek of the last exercise of this, and not... This is all exercises, five minute exercises of things to sit at home and write. And the last You one, don't know what that is, that's Romy's recent book. That I know, I just didn't want to plug it as a book, but it's a book. <laughs> five minute guide to emotional intelligence and it's, it's an, actually it's a journal, so you write in it, you answer the questions in the actual book. Day 30, so it's a 30 day challenge. This is the last day of your challenge, your last entry in this journal, are you ready? And this is your homework for all of you to have to write down. Let's get to the end. Yeah, I've got half an hour. <laughs> write yourself a love letter. Write the most beautiful, amazing, delicious love letter you have ever written. And yes, it is to you. How incredible your best friend. So for homework, whenever you have a minute, it would be amazing if you sat and wrote yourself a love letter. When was the last time you remember to tell ourselves? how amazing we are and why we love ourselves and how brilliant and beautiful and incredible we are. And really go there, really, you know, open yourself up to it. So. And that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Rom. Some really good gold nuggets there and some really good practical information and it was really, really good to see it in action with, um, what's your name again? With Victoria and see, you know, really witness, witness her and witness that change and realise that we can do that for ourselves or even, you know, if you, if you want to do it with someone else, grab a bestie or grab your friend or your partner or someone and maybe you can do that same exercise um, with someone.